thank you for being here, Mark. Sorry about the, these technical difficulties. It's a pleasure to be with you all. I hope you can hear me clearly. I can hear you well. Very good. Well, what could I share with you all from the Methodist story that would be helpful to where you are all are today? Well, um, we are in we are in a situation where um, there is a there is a group called All One Body, and they are they are trying to they're kind of the the gay lobby group of the Christian Reformed Church, and um, we we are. Um, up against them. They have a lot of influence at uh, Calvin University and Calvin Seminary and uh, the headquarters. So um, I guess we are interested in hearing your story of the contending for um, orthodoxy in the United Methodist Church. And uh, I will I will mention that you are talking to a bunch of Calvinists here, but uh, um, we are we are glad to have you, and we are uh, interested to hear about just your experiences in the United Methodist Church. Great. Well, I'm delighted to do so. I've been involved in Methodist controversies for going on almost 35 years, starting when I was a college student, going to the local convention of the United Methodist Church, and my original entry point was. Uh, concern over the church's missions board involvement in liberation theology, which is during the tail end of the Cold War. So that in, involved uh, literally supporting uh, the Sandinista government and other Marxist regimes and insurgencies, uh, which to me seemed quite scandalous. And so uh, that drew me into Methodist politics and started going to the Methodist Quadrennial Governing Convention every four years, uh, starting in 1992. And uh, quickly saw that uh, whatever the other controversies, the chief controversy dividing the traditional side from the revisionist side was uh, sexuality and had been since 1972 when the denomination first ratified its official teaching that homosexual practice was incompatible with Christian teaching. And so that had been a controversy ever since. And subsequent to that, uh, there were um, prohibitions on uh, actively homosexual persons serving uh, as pastors and also prohibitions on any celebration of same-sex unions or funding of causes advocating homosexuality. Uh, and so we have uh, fought those battles uh, for many decades and would have lost long ago, but the United Methodist Church uh, unique uh, I think among U.S. denominations is a global denomination uh, juridically governed by an international body. So uh, the growth of United Methodism in Africa is what saved us. When I first started going to the conventions, the Africans were maybe 5% of the total delegates, if that. They're now one third, and even that is an underrepresentation in that uh, they are now about one half of the total global membership. So 50 years ago, United Methodism had 11 million members in the U.S. Today, it's six and a half million. But now there are uh, six million or more United Methodists in Africa, growing by a couple of hundred thousand members every year as the U.S. church loses 100,000 members every year. So that ensured that the Orthodox side has continuously prevailed on sexuality every time and uh, culminating in a specially called convention in early 2019 that the liberal forces in the U.S. thought could be their opportunity to uh, overturn the church's teachings uh, and were quite surprised when thanks to the Africans, they were not only defeated, but additional regulations and limitations on sexuality were approved. So with that defeat, uh, there was a negotiation uh, in early, I'm sorry, late 2019 and revealed uh, in early 2020 an agreement to divide the denomination into a traditionalist and um, more liberal body, uh, which we would have uh, voted in by now, but for the pandemic. And so the next convention, uh, which we call General Conference, is now scheduled for August of this year. We'll Presumably, almost certainly, we will ratify this, what's called the protocol for separation, in which 
every congregation in every local region will have the opportunity to vote which direction it will go. I think the end result will be a 13 million United Methodists, about one third of the US church or maybe 2 million will go conservative and then almost all of the international church will go conservative. So maybe that will be a, what's being called the global Methodist church will start out with seven or 8 million and the liberal US United Methodist church will be uh, perhaps three and a half or Four million, but that will be a prolonged and very messy process. But at least there is a, an end game for us, and that's been unique in that all of the other mainline Protestant denominations, the conservative side, lost legislatively at their convention, and largely conservatives had to leave, very often uh, losing their properties, especially in the Episcopal Church. So in in uh, contending for for the faith in in over all these years, um, what's what has been your 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 joys and and your your sorrows over over that period? Well, uh, it's sad that uh, Orthodoxy and Methodism didn't fight this battle all over uh, earlier over uh, core theological issues, but uh, that was often slippery and difficult over to uh, discern exactly where the church had gone wrong and biblical authority back 80, 90, or 100 years ago. Uh, but the, con the sexuality issue was so concrete that that was the battle that uh, had to take place. And I guess the upside of that was uh, the um, fighting those battles did crystallize our own for our own faith, and I did think helped to build a um, relatively unified uh, evangelical subculture within United Methodism, uh, much stronger than existed in the other mainline churches, and has prepared us for this impending schism of the denomination. My understanding is that the United Methodist Church has tried to tried to be the the big tent of we can we can all work together united is in our name and uh let's try to stick it out uh but then at the last general conference um people who have been trying to just push to stay united at all costs have kind of started to realize that that was that was impossible is that is that accurate yes it is the um quote unquote compromise pushed by the liberal or self-identified centrist side in our case and in all the mainline denominations was uh, starting out with a local option. Well, how can you object if everyone gets to choose uh, what they want to do with the local church level? And uh, that was emphatically rejected by the general conference and by most conservatives. And we see where that went in the other mainline denominations, that was just uh, an incremental step for the uh, imposition of uh, the LGBTQ agenda. And we've seen that unfolding in the Presbyterian Church USA and the Episcopal Church and Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, and of course, long ago in the United Church of Christ. And uh, we're grateful that um, we've had our Africans, brothers and sisters who are even more adamant than we are on these issues and have given us uh, not only the numbers, uh, but uh, the spiritual fortitude to push ahead. So there's a suspicion among many here that um, that there are bigger issues involved besides just same-sex marriage and the LGBTQ agenda, that, that there are bigger underlying uh, doctrinal differences of the inspiration of, of scripture, the clarity of scripture, the purpose of the church, uh, among other um, among other fundamental base issues, um, have you found that to be the case that that uh, same sex marriage is just a, a a the tip of the iceberg of a bigger, more fundamental problem, um, or is uh, what have you discovered? Oh, very definitely. Obviously, it is. Um, it's a little hard to describe in ways that were not true. Uh, long ago, when I was a young man becoming involved in these issues, for example, uh, the old leadership of the denomination were still very much 
theological modernist who uh, did not believe in supernatural uh, the supernatural nature of the gospel, didn't believe in the bodily resurrection of the virgin birth, et cetera, et cetera. So you had that clear divide that's less the case now in that modernism faded and largely liberals and self-identified centrists uh, can honestly say they affirm the creed and believe in the virgin birth, uh, et cetera, but obviously have very squishy views on the authority of scripture. And I would summarize their difference with orthodoxy. They see the church's vocation to be one of affirmation rather than redemption and transformation. And I think that's the major divide. Okay. Uh, we, uh, in the Christian Reformed Church is a, um, you might call a confessional church. Um, every office bearer, minister, elder, and deacon has to sign a covenant for office bearers, which means that we agree with uh, the Apostles, Nicene, Athanasian Creed, along with uh, the Heidelberg Catechism, uh, Belgian Confession, and uh, the Canons of Dort. And, uh, and so being that, um, we are a confessional denomination. Um, now, I'm, I'm gathering that uh, the Methodist Church's uh, 25 articles of religion uh, does not carry that weight in the United Methodist Church, um, or, or is that incorrect? De facto, obviously, they uh, have not, and this goes back more than a century, such that uh, the liberal side of the church, and that includes not most laity, but most clergy in the U.S., are genuinely befuddled and uh, confused and feel almost betrayed by the current circumstances because they rose up through an institution that told them this was the trajectory, and uh, naturally that would conclude with the official liberalization of our sexuality standards, and now to reach this roadblock and be told no, in fact, that cannot happen, uh, they did not um, expect that. But uh, coming up to the, the official seminaries, uh, the Articles of Religion were uh, uh, at best a, a sideshow, and they looked to other uh, sources of authority. Okay. So the United Methodist Church has had a lot of conservative victories at least in the recent years. Um, I know that uh, recently um, you disaffiliated with uh, the pro, pro-choice, pro-abortion um, coalition of, of churches, um, among other things. Uh, but if, um, since the conservatives have, have won a lot at the general conference level, um, why is the split still happening? And uh, why are the conservatives leaving um, even though um, the, there's been a lot of conservative victories. How did that happen? Well, I'm glad you brought up abortion because the United Methodists were in the forefront of abortion, abortion rights and endorsed it in 1970 at a convention after a mere 20-minute debate and then helped to found the Religious Coalition for Abortion Rights in 1973. So it was momentous after many years of fighting that battle that we officially withdrew from that abortion coalition at the general conference of uh, 2016. That was a momentous victory and signaled where we were heading. As to why conservatives are quote unquote uh, leaving, uh, the negotiation for the protocol for division uh, essentially um, would orchestrate the um, creation of a new uh, traditionalist denomination, as I mentioned, to be called the Global Methodist Church. Uh, I think that conservatives in that negotiation felt that uh, the bureaucracy was not, uh, most conservatives do not want to inherit it. We've never had uh, uh, any part in its uh, governance in the lifetimes of anyone currently alive. Uh, the seminaries are not owned by the church, and with two except with one exception of the 13 official seminaries, they all are liberal. The uh, local bureaucratic structures for what we call conferences that roughly follow state lines are almost all liberal. So there's just very very little desire to inherit these structures. The liberal side has controlled them; they esteem them, 
And uh, so the idea that even if we could win legislatively, that we would want to fight additional battles, perhaps involving many more years and almost inevitably litigation because many of the church agencies are semi-autonomous. Uh, uh, conservatives just did not have any great interest uh, in that battle and preferred a fresh start. So the division allows every local church and every uh, state level conference to vote where it wants to go. So if uh, Alabama wants to go conservative, which I think it will, uh, it's state level uh, conferences, North Alabama, and South Alabama will go into the global Methodist church and all of the local churches in those conferences will go with them unless they uh, officially vote to dissent and stay in the liberalized United Methodist Church. If you're in Virginia, where I am, that will stay with the liberal United Methodist Church, but a local church can vote itself into the global Methodist Church. And I would expect maybe 25% of Virginia will go into the global Methodist Church. So we, in the Christian Reformed Church, we are running into something similar where a lot of the bureaucracy our, our headquarters, offices, our universities, and so forth, um, they tend to attract the, the liberal crowd um, and, um, and the, the conservative uh, base and the roots, they tend to be just, uh, well, people like us, you know, your, your, your regular, your pastors, youth leaders, uh, elders, and so forth. Why is it that uh, the liberal the liberals are attracted to the uh, administrative bureaucratic side and and the the conservatives not well often theological liberals are not very successful pastors so uh, they can do better professionally working for a church agency or in a seminary whereas uh, those who are more evangelical and have a, a passion for soul saving have very little incentive to go into the church bureaucracy or even to teach uh, in the seminaries and much would prefer to be at the local church level. So it's pretty much uh, self uh, sorting, but to illustrate where the church has gone in the US, um, 25, 30 years ago, there was a poll of the laity uh, showing that two thirds self-identified as conservative. Uh, two or three years ago, there was a new poll showing that 44% uh, self-identified as conservative. So that was, a significant drop, still a plurality, still outnumbering liberals by two to one among the laity, but clearly in the U.S. part of the church, uh, there is an ongoing drift that will only get worse um, unless we have this division. So so here's here's a question that comes up in, in our circles a lot. Um, is the Christian Reformed Church worth saving? Um, if uh, the if if the agencies, the the general secretary, um, the uh, the head offices, the university, and uh, increasingly the seminary are are kind of occupied by revisionists, um, then uh, then is the denomination worth saving? Because in in your experience with the United Methodist Church, um, the conservative group has decided to form the global Methodist church instead um, and to let every, uh, the, the revisionists have the seminaries and the institution. Um, what are your thoughts on, on that for, for us? Well, the United Methodist Church has a very large bureaucracy, although it has shrunk dramatically with declining resources and numbers over the last 20 years. But I believe our missions board in New York City has an annual budget of... Uh, Last I checked, about $150 million. Uh, we have a, a lobby office in Capitol Hill by the Supreme Court building. Uh, its budget is uh, seven or eight million. So I think the total bureaucracy for the Methodist Church maybe spends um, about 200 or $250 million a year, very large. And their total assets are 800 million, last I checked. So uh, some people on our side are, uh, have complained that uh, too much was ceded in this negotiation for division. But again, uh, those agencies never belonged to us to begin with. And the local churches, 30,000 local churches in the US are valued uh, 
it's estimated about 60 billion. So that's a much more uh, important number in terms of whether or not it's, but for us that even if we wanted to fight uh, to reclaim the bureaucracy, we won at the special general conference by 53%. That's um, not an overwhelming majority. And that, that depends on all the Africans being able to get to the convention. I suspect uh, in your denomination, you have a much more robust majority, especially among the laity. So uh, I don't know how large your bureaucracy is or what the votes have been at your latest convention, but uh, if you're getting 60% of the votes or more on key issues, uh, I think you should uh, fight it out. Okay. So that's, so that's, that is helpful to know. We, we do have a large bureaucracy. There might be some people here who can, uh, speak to that a little more than, than I could. Uh, but that is, that is helpful um, because, um, because that question does come up a lot. Um, and, uh, and yeah, is, is the CRC worth saving? We do have some, we do have some good votes on our Senate floor. We have, um, we've, we've had some good votes in the, in the past. Um, but the, administration and uh, the agencies, uh, the people at headquarters seem to always be able to frame the discussions. Um, they are the ones who seem to funnel the, the, the material forward and um, seem to be able to set the pace for those discussions. And so it, it, can, be, it can be exhausting to be constantly fighting battles. Um, what, uh, this question just popped up here that I think is helpful. What advice would you have for dealing with those who advocate for the, let's just agree to disagree and the local option um, kind of arguments? If, how do, how, what's the best way to, to uh, respond to those people? Can you hear me now? A little bit. Hi, video, Not audio working. I can hear it. We can hear you just a bit. Well, it's uh, been disastrous in all of the denominations that have tried it, and it's always a preliminary first step towards a more complete liberalization. So you look at what happened at the uh, Episcopal Church, where um, when they first approved the election of their first openly, actively homosexual bishop in 2003, the, uh, let me see, they had two houses that voted on it at their convention. The House of, House of Bishops, I think, voted 40 or 44 percent against it. So it, there was a significant uh, minority against it, which is almost completely collapsed. There were several, a couple dozen dioceses that originally were conservative. And that's now down to, could be numbered on one hand. Uh, for example, the Albany Diocese, Albany, New York, uh, their conservative bishop was recently uh, ousted. Uh, there have been other cases. So uh, once you accept the premise of agree to disagree, uh, I think it's just going to be a, a slow or maybe not so slow march of um, attrition. Right. And I think we can see that in the, the ELCA. There have been more and more. Uh, I've been following following that progress on uh, uh, your the, the blog Juicy Ecumenism and, and uh, just the progress of the uh, revisionist side there. Um, and uh, what, in light of your experience in the United Methodist Church, uh, what would you anticipate being the biggest obstacles to a denomination that desires to become increasingly and deeply rooted in scripture? Well, obviously, uh, it starts in the seminaries, and we're going to, in the new Global Methodist Church, uh, have to figure out how not to repeat uh, the mistakes that brought down the Methodist Church uh, starting 100 years ago or more in terms of uh, giving the seminaries uh, autonomy, uh, even though they were funded by the church, and allowing the seminaries to completely subvert the church's um, theology. Um, obviously, the seminaries are going to need to be servants of the church and not autonomous uh, lecturing bodies uh, outside the authority of the church. Um, so uh, I don't know how many uh, official seminaries uh, you all have. We have 
13 official seminaries, uh, and then seminarians are also permitted to go to non-Methodist seminaries uh, if they're on an approved list. The largest of those is Evangelical Asbury Seminary, which produces more United Methodist seminarians than any of the official seminaries do. So that's been a great gift to us, uh, uh, and it's one of the ten. Lar Asbury is one of the ten largest seminaries in America. And then one of our uh, official seminaries, one of the thirteen, actually flipped from liberal to more conservative about ten or fifteen years ago, which was remarkable. So the new denomination will have Asbury uh, United and uh, possibly a couple of other independent seminaries. And uh, we'll have to uh, be very careful how it negotiates seminary education. So United Methodist Church, for example, acknowledges um, a Yale Divinity School, a Harvard Divinity School, Princeton, uh, other seminaries that have no Methodist connection and have not been Orthodox for many, many decades to graduate our seminarians. So to you said a moment ago that it would be good to fight it out if we have the votes on on the floor of our senate um we do have we have one seminary um which is calvin theological seminary in grand rapids michigan um you would it sounds like what you're saying is that the the battle for the for the for the bureaucracy and the future of the denomination begins with the seminary is that what you're saying it does. And so I don't know uh, how your seminary, Calvin, uh, where they are theologically, how many professors you would have uh, confidence in, but uh, that's uh, a very important uh, institution that I would think would be worth fighting for. Okay. Um, that, that, is, that is very helpful. One, there's one professor there, the professor of our church order, no less, who is taking, taking uh, a stand and saying that uh, our Senate cannot discipline uh, lower lower bodies. So even though we have a church that has gone against our denominational stance and ordained a deacon in a same-sex marriage, that the Senate can do nothing about that. Um, and that is, that is not our interpretation or our understanding of the church order, but when uh, it is the professor of church order and church polity uh, at the seminary, that is a powerful voice on the Senate floor as to uh, what can what can be done. Um, so discipline seems to be a, a key factor in the future of the church. In the Belgian Confession, it's one of the marks of the true church. Um, the proper preaching of the word, the proper administration of the sacraments, and the the doing of discipline. So one question that comes up here, if, if the CRC church as a whole lacks the resolve to exercise the third mark of the true church, which is discipline, will it resolve on the part of our synod to make the orthodox position on human sexuality con confessional, like required, make any difference? Or does it spell an endless battle replete with continual subversions? Well, it will be an endless battle if you have more and more clergy coming uh, down the pipe who uh, dissent from the church's official teaching. So that was our issue. The teachings were orthodox, but the seminaries kept graduating generation after generation of clergy who could not uh, affirm the orthodoxy of our church. So that's a crucial question. I don't, uh, are most of the faculty at Calvin more orthodox? Um. Somebody else maybe weigh in on on that for me. Um, somebody else a little closer to the to the seminary. I'd be interested in entertaining some comments on on that. Can I speak to this for a second? Yeah, <clears throat> sure. This was my question. I'm I'm not sure that the seminary is going to make a difference at the end of the day. Um, our uh, people coming into the church are being widely and variously trained at different institutions at this point. And the requirement is to go into Calvin Seminary for 10 weeks. <clears throat> and I don't know that those who are dissenting are speaking um, explicitly, it's rather subversively. My concern is that, um, you know, even if we as a denomination decide that this is going to be a confessional matter, you need to subscribe to the orthodox position on human sexuality 
in accord with our 1973 report and are in accord with the report that's just been come out. There are going to be pastors, as there are throughout our denomination, some of them quite quiet right now, who disagree or who, who will claim that they continue to sit on the fence, that they're still looking at the matter. Um, for me, this is going to be a corrosive presence because if there is not the resolve on the part of <clears throat> the church as a whole to exercise discipline um, for theological matters. In my 25 years um, in the church, I have seen essentially zero resolve to exercise any discipline over any matter, particularly if it comes to a theological matter. Maybe if somebody is cheating against their wife or something like that, or their husband, um, but uh, not for any other reason. And I'm just beginning to wonder if this is sustainable or whether we ought to uh, find a different way out sooner. If you all are the majority of the denomination, is there any way to incentivize uh, clergy who are dissenters to leave and form their own new body, or is that not plausible? Well, I, there is a proposal like that on the table, but I'm thinking here, even at my own church, um, you know, there, there are presences here who've been here for 40, 50 years. Um, they will never, they will never go. I don't think it would ever work for them. So it comes down to the local body and what does that look like? I just don't think people will leave. So you're going to have that subversive presence without the concomitant desire to, or will to discipline. You know, I think, Mark, one of the unique, and that's not unique to the Christian Reformed Church, but we're still quite an ethnically homogenous body overall. You know, there's, you know, the, the Dutch Reformed um, connection is still very pervasive across the denomination, even as we've uh, grown in diversity over the years. Um, so there's a lot of, and being a smaller denomination of only, you know, a couple hundred thousand people, members, you know, you know, Aunt Josie is in the church down the street. And, you know, so you have all this, there's a lot of familial connection between our denominations. There's probably lots of family connections right in the Zoom call here at this time too. So I think that's another complicating factor versus the largeness of the U of the United Methodist Church. And so you're, you're, you're always speaking against somebody's cousin at, in the Christian yep. Reformed Church, it feels like. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't go ahead. Go ahead. No, you go ahead, Aaron. Um, no, I was I was just going to to say, um, just over over your years of fighting in the United Methodist Church, um, some of us kind of get weary um, over over the battle, and um, I'm just wondering if if you um, from your experience have any. Have any encouragement uh, for us to to keep keep the battle going um, uh, from your from your experience fighting in the United Methodist Church? Well, definitely yes, uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, one of which is uh, it sounds as though you can run someplace else and hide from this battle. Almost mm. everywhere else you go, it's going to follow you. There is no safe space. You may as well stay and fight where you are. Uh, also, I, for me as a Methodist, it's important to defend our tradition. And uh, it is uphill the last couple of decades, especially because Americans care less and less about denominations. When I first started, there were still middle-aged and old people who cared very much about being Methodist and had been Methodist for many generations, but your typical person under the age of 50 usually doesn't care that very much about their denominational association. And uh, one of the losses is that uh, is that you're losing uh, the, uh, the teachings and traditions that go along with the great Protestant traditions and uh, leaving Christians to be more and more autonomous and um, in the moment and less and less connected to historic Christianity and more and more inclined to non-denominational churches, which have often great vitality and much to teach and offer, but very often uh, do not or will not survive beyond the first generation without the wider community of the denomination. So 
for that reason, I think your denomination and its history are very much worth uh, contending for. And uh, I don't know how large your the dissenters are within your denomination, uh, if it's 20% or 30% or, or 50%, but if it's close to half, then maybe you're better off preemptively offering uh, a, uh, a division of the denomination and uh, dividing the bureaucracy and allowing everyone to go their own way, realizing that uh, that still is going to be very, very messy, and uh, you're never going to have a complete uh, sorting out, but that may be one way to deal with it. But if you have 70 or 80 percent, I think it's worth uh, going for preservation of the denomination intact, but offering an option for those who cannot stay. That's um, that's some good advice. Chad, I'm going to I'm going to turn it over to you and maybe you can have some other people ask sure. some questions of their own. Sure. Yeah. So before we kind of get to the get to some more questions, we've got a few of them rolling in. We've been asking them along the way. But Mark, I think we, we sit in the same spot where the, the conservatives are, are generally more about preaching the gospel, pastoring in their local congregations. They're not about the bureaucracy. So we're seeing that same sort of thing. And I think a lot of us feel uh, deflated because those who are who are eager for those denominational posts, those who aspire to that, they tend to be the more liberal. So the so the 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 function of the denomination is is held by the liberals, and that seems to be the case across the board at many places. But you know, I, I'm I'm very confident that the vast majority of the CRC is orthodox on this matter and orthodox on many other matters, you know, um, when it comes to biblical fidelity and those sorts of things. So I think we're, we're resonating in those ways, even though the contexts are very different in, in, in many respects, there's a lot of commonality when it comes to that sort of thing. Um, so I, I think I'm just gonna open it up to, to some questions from anybody. Uh, I know you, we can put some in the chat here and um, some of them have been asked, some of them had not been asked, but why don't you just, um, you can, you can raise your hand or just jump in the conversation if you do have a question directly for Mark. Now, before you get to that, Mark, I'd just love to hear a little bit about your work with the Institute and just kind of what do you do? What, what is the Institute about? And I think that would be helpful for us just to kind of get to know you even a little bit more. The Institute was founded in 1981 uh, as an ecumenical Christian uh, think tank to make the Christian case for especially democracy, human rights, and religious freedom. Again, in the Cold War, the influence of liberation theology was pervasive in the mainline Protestant world and in parts of the Catholic Church. And so IRD's founders wanted to uh, counteract and offer a more positive option for political and social witness for Christianity in America. Although ecumenical, our early history was very tied to the mainline Protestant world when that was much more mm, sure. important. We had Methodists. Episcopal Presbyterian programs, even a Lutheran program, but obviously traditionalists lost their battles in most of those denominations. So the last 20 years, much more focused on the generic uh, evangelical world, especially its political and social witness, and trying to uh, encourage churches to uh, root their social political witness and historic teachings, and that just uh, floating along the, uh, above the surface of um, contemporary American politics. Uh, but uh, our Methodist program remains very uh, important mm -hmm. to us, and obviously it's a, a passion for me uh, sure. personally. And I would recommend to you all, again, not knowing your polity very well, but we had, in Methodism, we just kept tightening and tightening and tightening the rules on sexuality to, to bring it, uh, to force people to choose, and that's how we got to where we are. So that may be mm -hmm. what you all need to do as well. Don't leave anything vague or opaque. Just tighten it down. Also... This has been our great failure. Here we are dividing our denomination over marriage and sexuality, uh, but uh, we don't, I, it just uh, came to my realization, we have one Orthodox Christian ethicist, United Methodist in all of the United States right now, who's now in his late mm -hmm. 60s. We've had no one working on theology of marriage. So again, conservatives fighting this battle that have done almost no serious work theologically explaining uh, the theology of marriage. And again, that uh, explains in part why we are where we are. That's fascinating to think about. So, so you're saying that, you know, the liberals were the ones that were doing the theology 
on on marriage and those sorts of things or on human sexuality. The conservatives were not contributing to that part of the conversation. That's correct. Yeah. Good. Hey, um, so thank you for that. That that does help us get to know you and a bit of, of the work that you're involved with. Does anybody out what does anybody have other questions for, for Mark or or ways that uh, yeah, what the United Methodists have gone through, what he's doing now, all of those things. There's, what can we, um, what, would you like, what else would you like to hear? Uh, this was a question that was put in the chat earlier. I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, but they said, why do the liberals receive most of the press in the public square when they do the least amount of work? I'm not asking you to answer that question, but I think it's I think it, I think it's true. I mean, they, they're the I mean, part of it's the media, part of it's you know whatever. But they, they get they get the most press even in the public square, um, even though there's they're, they're doing very little work. The, the conservatives are the ones that are doing all the work on the ground, uh, rather than at the bureaucracy bureaucracy level. So. Um, well, that's right. They're far more politically um, activists and organizing uh, events uh, and yep. photo opportunities and making statements. So they're far easier to cover in that regard. I also want to make this point that it's already obvious to you, but uh, it's true globally that only declining denominations have officially liberalized their teachings on sexuality. And in every case, once they have officially liberalized, that decline has accelerated. I can't mm -hmm. think of a single exception and denominations that have officially liberalized their sexuality are consequently uh, older, whiter, mm -hmm. less diverse, plunging numbers of marriages, ironically, plunging numbers of baptisms. So uh, all of those trends are against them. So the claims and verbiage about, uh, oh, we have to appeal to young people by doing such and such, no validity to those arguments. You know, you said that you said ironically, and it, it's so true. I mean, it, it's the liberals are the ones that are supposed to be championing championing diversity and and those sorts of things. And yet, you're exactly right. When we're seeing those churches in decline, they become, like you said, become whiter, become older, become less diverse. You know, even within our own context too, many of our ethnic minority congregations really want nothing to do with this debate. They're wondering why yeah. we're debating it. Did you, get, did you find the same thing yeah. in the United Methodist Church? I mean, obviously you're seeing that in the in the global Methodist Church, Africa and so forth, but yeah, you're seeing that same thing there. It is, so the uh, caucus for uh, sexual liberalism among Methodists is called reconciling. Uh, they claim hundreds of churches have associated with them. I forget the latest number, but 5% uh, of United Methodists are uh, black in the US. Mm. And uh, so there are, probably at least five or 600 or 700 black United Methodist congregations, none of which have associated with reconciling congregations. None of the Korean congregations have, I can't think of a single ethnic or non-white congregation that is associated with uh, reconciling. Uh, I'm from Northern Virginia outside DC where there are a hundred United Methodist churches. I think that uh, that'll go 90% uh, liberal with the division and at best 10% conservative, but the conservative will include the, the three church plants uh, from uh, immigrants from Ghana, mm. uh, the Korean churches, the Vietnamese church. Now you, you mentioned reconciliation church. Are those, is that the, is that the group within the United Methodist church that is pushing the uh, LGBTQ um, Inclusion within yes, the, if you're going you know, to be LGBTQ uh, affirming, you join uh, reconciling congregations. Reconciling congregations, okay. Hey, we all have those. We all have those groups in action. Um, now, you had mentioned earlier about a seminary that had changed course ten years ago or so that that was more liberal, went more moved toward conservative. What, what's a little bit of the story on that? And which seminary is that? Or if you're, if you want to tell us, but. Um, yeah, what's kind of the story on that? And are there any lessons in there for us? It's United Seminary in Dayton, Ohio. And uh, about 15 years ago, they were in a financial crisis and had a number of retirements. And suddenly they realized that the Orthodox professors 
had the majority and they had a new orthodox um, uh, president, uh, a woman, mm. and they made the most of it and turned uh, in a more conservative direction. Now there's a, uh, a man who is orthodox, is uh, the dean of the seminary. And I think they have uh, a dozen professors of whom two or three are liberal, uh, but close to retirement age. And uh, they have uh, grown and have focused on uh, interchurch ministry and have become very racially diverse. Mm. They have a strong um, charismatic edge to them. And uh, so, yeah, of the 13, they're the only one that will likely associate with the new global Methodist church. Those are always fascinating stories because they're rare stories. You know, most often you see the trajectory is, is to the left, not to the right. I think a lot of us are familiar with, or at least know of the, the, how, the same thing happening in the Southern Baptist Seminary in Louisville, you know, and, um, you know, a move to the, a move toward faithfulness and fidelity and, and, and orthodoxy. So that is a fascinating well, story. Well, of course, the, the conservative resurgence among Southern Baptists uh, is very famous, but uh, they have such a more democratic polity that once you had a majority at their annual convention, to elect the president that just cleared the deck in terms of appointments to the church agencies and the seminaries but we methodists never had that uh, we're far less democratic and it's much more circuitous and i suspect uh, that's probably true for you all as well sure sure good um anybody else have any any questions for mark any other comments at this point May I pose a question, Chad? Sure, Jim, please. My name is uh, Jim Vanderloo. I belong to Waterloo CRC in, uh, in Ontario. And uh, I'm a laity. I'm not a pastor. I, I see a number of pastors in, uh, in my video here. Um, but one of the things that I think the average person who is in the member of the congregation uh, is thinking is we see these postings on YouTube for people with all one body who are pastors, who are professors. Um, and, and the question I have is, what do they know that we don't know? What, where is it, where is it, where uh, are they coming from? You use the term liberal and conservative. And, and I think a lot of the uh, membership in the CRC uh, at the laity level is conservative. But what, what where is it that, that they seem to be so different from a lot of others in terms of their understanding of scripture? What sin? So Jim, Jim, give me well, your point. Uh, yeah. oh, go ahead, Mark, sorry. I'm sorry, yeah, go ahead. I don't know. Uh, I no, think you're asking why are they- uh, Jim, I was gonna ask they you- just Where they clear. are theologically? Yeah, I was yeah. gonna ask you to clarify your question, yeah. Yeah. What do they seem? What do they know that we don't seem to know? <laughs> so, are you talking about how you know why is it that why is it that the laity is more conservative, or why is it that the yes, okay, yes, and so all the people who seem to be at the higher level in terms of education and standing in the or in the church, uh, professors and and experienced ministers who we all look up to. Um, they seem to be in that liberal side. So, so why, is that, why is so, academia more liberal is what you're saying? Or why are those yeah. who are more learned, so to speak, yeah. tend to fall more liberal? Yes. What do you say to that, Mark? Well, I guess for uh, complex sociological reasons, uh, more liberal people are attracted to academia and obviously they want uh, respectability and admiration beyond the church which entails moving to the left uh, theologically and otherwise whereas uh, the laity your typical lay person who's motivated to regularly go to church and uh, has the blessing of not being seminary educated and not subject to the fads and trends of uh, the seminary and it's just uh, their religious knowledge is based on their own Bible reading and traditions and uh, the hymns of the mm -hmm. church uh, are much more inclined to stay traditional. And if, if when they lose their traditional faith, 
often more likely they just stop uh, coming to church, whereas those who may be on the edge of losing their faith or certainly becoming heterodox, uh, once you're already an employee in the system, uh, well, you, know, you're in, uh, you don't want to lose your job, so you just stay in and end up you know, subverting uh, your church. Wow. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Laura, please. Yes. Um, first off, I wanted to thank you, Mark, for all your, not just your important work over these decades, but also your endurance, I think, mm -hmm. for you to hold fast um, in, in, and swim upstream in your denomination um, must have taken just a lot of, of muscle and faith and prayer. And so I, I want to honor you for um, your faithful endurance through all these years. Um, I have two questions. Yeah, one is, so um, my context is in a, in, uh, on the reservation um, in Native America um, in the Four Corners area. And um, I know that among, in our denomination, our, our Korean churches, our Navajo churches, our Hispanic churches, as has already been mentioned, uh, has uh, real, real um, hesitations about the, those who hold the keys to the kingdom, the, the, the bureaucracies, um, flirtation with revisionist theology. And yet there's a real, um, um, cautiousness or even a, a, a fear to speak on these issues. And so, um, so I'm, I'm very intrigued by your story of those voices from, from Africa and other diverse places who, who really, uh, made the difference in, in your context. Um, so my questions are number one is, I guess I assume that a lot of those African pastors had been um, trained in in your 13 seminaries here that had more liberalizing influences and 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 what kept them from um, kind of um, imbibing that same worldview and 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 maybe I'm wrong maybe they had uh, seminaries right in their own local areas but um, and then number two, those those um, minority voices that are more faithful. How how ha, have you found something that helps encourage and embolden a witness when there may be a more uh, hesitation because of the language barrier or because of other um, sociological factors? So if that made any sense. <laughs> Yes. Uh, well, thank you for your kind words. Uh, the African church, uh, most of their clergy have not gone to seminary. Uh, very few have gone to U.S. seminaries. They do have seminaries in Africa that, of course, are conservative. Uh, there's one seminary in Zimbabwe that was the great hoopla created by the U.S. church, uh, but and is it's not liberal, but it's not as conservative, and uh, the Africans prefer other more conservative seminaries and uh, the few liberals who are in Africa there are so because they went to US seminaries or have some ties to the US church so that's predictable uh in terms of uh non-white church members uh, in the US uh you're right they often tend to stay below the radar and to avoid controversy uh many of the black united methodists uh, although they're theologically orthodox or of course, more liberal theologically, and for a number of historic reasons, uh, are not comfortable collaborating with uh, uh, white uh, evangelicals. So it'll be interesting to see when the church divides uh, where they come down. Uh, but uh, the Koreans in the U.S. will almost certainly go conservative, but they have not been very high visibility. And there are other ethnic groups on the West Coast. There are South Pacific Islanders and uh, others who are conservative, but I think uh, they have just tried to avoid uh, controversy in state borough within their own communities. So any advice on how to um, encourage uh, a, a greater presence and witness in our denominational discussions? Because oh, we, we do put a high premium, a high value on diversity and and yet our diverse voice, voices some sometimes stay um, 
stay uh, in in the background. Mm -hmm. Well, you have to draw them out, uh, host an event uh, where there are the speakers, whether it's online or a physical event, and uh, strive to give them some prominence and encourage them in terms of how much they're uh, appreciated and their influence is uh, important and uh, needed. But now, right now, they may not uh, have a venue. So there's even if they were willing to be more public, uh, they probably don't understand how they would even begin. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Anyone even else? a series of uh, YouTube vid videos you could organize where uh, young people and uh, racial minorities uh, speak and address the theology of sexuality and uh, marriage, that could be a good starting point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mark. Anybody else? Questions for Mark? Uh, Harry. Hello, Mark. Thank you very much for making the time to speak with us. Um, I'm speaking here from Ontario, Canada. And um, yeah, the Anglican Global Network it seems to be kind of 15 years ahead of kind of what what's happening in the United Methodist Church. And I don't know what's going to happen in the CRC, but do you think there are any lessons to be learned in terms of, um, you know, how they're doing now? You know, like, are we just splintering into smaller groups where it is harder to have um, effectiveness as, as, as a denomination? If we have you reflected on any of that in terms of what's going on? in the Anglican Global Network? Well, we work very closely with uh, friends in the Anglican Church of North America. We have a, a staffer who's in leadership and one of their bishops is on our board. And there are many, many Anglican churches here in DC and uh, in the wider DC area. So uh, they tend to have influence and a profile much higher than what their numbers might otherwise uh, Suggest so, yes, different. their situation was different for the Methodists in that they, of course, lost their vote in the Episcopal Church, had to leave. Most of them lost their properties, had to start fresh. The wonderful false church, historic false church in Northern Virginia, after years of litigation, lost their over 230, 40-year-old building. But they had built a brand new $50 million church, uh, a higher profile location, and they are thriving. They planted many new churches in the D.C. area, many of them full of young people. So there's a lot to be learned from them, but they have all of the human issues. You would expect them to have divisions and controversies over uh, racial issues and uh, political issues. And so there's nowhere you can go where there's going to be complete uh, uniformity, but uh, they have done a great work and uh, they have offered us a lot to, uh, to learn from. Yeah, that's helpful. I mean, it's others have walked this path before us. You know, I think we can all say that you can look to other denominations that have uh, walked down these paths, and you can you can learn from one another. And we need to learn from one another. And I think we all we every every denomination thinks, well, we're going to do this differently than everybody else. You know, you head into the same the same uh, waters. I think we're going to swim it differently than the others have sw have uh, swam in the past. Um. Anybody else? If not, we will uh, we will set Mark free to get on with his day. Oh, I Cedric! Do. Cedric has a question, so we'll Cedric go for it. Well, well, if you be the last question for Mark, and then we'll we'll send him on his way. Yeah, but thank you, Mark, for for being with us. As others have said, I um, my question for you is when uh, when do we in your in your experience, so when would you say we call it quits? <laughs> um, I guess this is uh, when I think of, uh, you know, at some point the United Methodist Church uh, conservative leaders said, you know what, it's not worth uh, continuing this in the United Methodist Church. It's time for us to withdraw. Um, at what point would you say, um, you know what, everything has been tried and we you know, the, the fight is not is no longer a good use of our resources and time. Well, I don't think you should uh, ever quit. Uh, to be a Christian is to be called to uh, constant uh, struggle. 
uh, I guess it's just a question of what uh, venue you prefer to fight in where you're most uh, effective. But uh, again, it sounds like you all still have the majority. You have not lost uh, any votes. Uh, I think you have every reason to be hopeful and just need to strategize in terms of how to maximize your strength. Uh, I don't think the uh, conservative leaders of Methodism uh, decided to uh, quit. Uh, they won, we won a major battle in 2019, and that gave us the, uh, the strength and political capital to negotiate a settlement that ends the battle and uh, effectively is dividing the denomination. I don't think anyone is actually uh, leaving. The United Methodist Church is effectively, uh, which was founded in 1968, is effectively going to end in the year 2022 and become two separate distinct uh, denominations. So I see that as a win. And Mark, too, that's the reason this group exists is to is, is because we believe that there's something worth fighting for, you know, and that there's certainly worth the energy. And I, I think what you said, too, is, is something that's important to remember is that this is going to be a fight wherever we are, that you were called into the battle, um, no matter where we are in whatever stage we're in. And there's no other place to hide. You had said that earlier. So thank you. And yet, I'm going to reiterate what Laura had said, too. I mean, your your faithfulness over a long haul and certainly um, you know, the battles have been different and yet the same in the United Methodist Church. But it's been you've, you've been fighting in a, in a, for a longer period of time than many of us have. And so we're thankful for that. That's 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 an encouragement to us. And we appreciate you uh, taking the time to share with us today. So uh, we just uh, wish you God's blessings and anything parting that you would like to say before we, uh, before we let you go. Well, I appreciate your all's uh, faithfulness and learning more about your leadership and ministry. I hope you'll keep me uh, informed about your battles, which are not very well reported on. So perhaps one or more of you could write some articles about what's happening in your denomination. We'd be glad to publish them or you could find other outlets as well. But I think others would be uh, very gratified to know what's happening. Okay, we will keep you connected to folks that are part of our media and communications. Now I see Laura, you got your hand up. You got something you want to say for Mark or is this beyond that? No, no, that was my clap, clap, clap. Oh, that was uh, your clap. Gratitude. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I'm missing and, the cues and, here. and my Pentecostal praise the Lord. So <laughs> your Zoom Pentecostal praise the Lord. Good. Well, hey, Mark, thank you for being with us. And uh, we just wish you God's blessings. And thanks for taking the time with us today. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. God bless you all. Yeah. Thanks. Bye-bye.